Okay, so you've taken the time, you've finished making your score look fantastic, you finished the piece, you finished the parts, you've bound them, you're ready to have your, your first rehearsal of your music, and then you realize, well, I don't exactly know how to get everyone together for this. I don't really, I don't know anyone, I don't know any people, and all of a sudden you have to make this big transition from being a composer person to a personnel manager person. And it's kind of tricky. It's not intuitive to suddenly switch gears like this. But unfortunately, this is a big part of how our industry works. Managing people and getting them into the same room and getting to make the thing that you have made come alive is a whole art form in and of itself. So I wanted to make a video about the process of, of having a successful rehearsal of your music. My name is David Vest. I'm a composer. This is a video about how to make a rehearsal happen. So the first question that you're going to ask yourself is, are you responsible? responsible for putting the performers together. Not every event needs this. Like if you're doing something like for a, with like a wind ensemble reading, you know, with the school band or something, then that's not really going to be on you to do it. But if you have put your name in the slot for the composition department concert, or you said you're going to do a brass quintet, well then you need to put together a brass quintet to make it happen. Putting a group of people together, this is a tough problem, especially for composer people because we tend to be we tend to be shy. We tend to be a little on the uh, people do not come naturally to composers as a general rule. Obviously, we're all different. We all do things differently, but so how do you do it? How do you bridge this gap? How do you actually make this happen? You're gonna need to reach out to your network. So what is your network? You probably hear that word thrown around a ton. Your network is the collection of people that you know that are within your industry or profession at large. For music people, we know performers, we know teachers, we know conductors, we know composers, we know fellow students. If you write music for film, then you would include directors and filmmakers and screenwriters and people involved in that industry there. If you write music for video games, then you would add game designers and game people to that. Dancers, if you write music for choreography, or, or even, even business owners, if you do music for ads or whatever. Whoever are people that you can serve, that is who is in your network. Now, if you're a student, it's probably just going to be other people in your class. And that's Fine, that's great, uh, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's the beginning of, of, of your network. Your network is extremely valuable. It is essential to your career, it's essential to your journey just as a human being. You will see how important it is to be visible in your community. Word of mouth is everything. The way that you're gonna have to find people if you have to find them by word of mouth is exactly the same way that they're gonna find you if they need a composer. Oh, who do you know? Oh, well, I know I worked with so-and-so on Woodwind Quintet and it was pretty cool. It's all word of mouth. It's all people. The industry works with people. People make things happen. If you're trying to put something together like a brass quintet and you don't know anyone, well then ask people in your class who play brass instruments. You gotta keep in mind that instrumentalists, you know, when we're off in composer class, if we get to do that, if you're a composer, Position student. Instrumentalists are in chamber music. They're in conductor's orchestra. They're in ensembles and they get to interact and play with all of these different people. Brass people tend to know the rest of the brass people in the department. If you're looking for a trombone player, then you have a friend who plays tuba, they might know someone. They probably do because they've had to play with them in wind ensemble or whatever. The same is true for the woodwinds and the strings and the percussion. Obviously it can mix and match. I'm just generalizing just for simplicities. This is another reason why it is so valuable for you if you you are in school and you are a performer, like you know how to play your instrument, you're at a decent level, or you're a singer or whatever it is that you do, to be in the ensemble with these people. It's worth it getting to know people and getting to meet them and getting to work with them and then work with you. It's invaluable. Make friends with performers. It's like they, they are essential to your life and as much fun as it is to spend time around composer people, it's performers and conductors and people like that who make things happen more so than other composer people. Now before you go off, getting a bunch of people together and making this thing happen, there is some information that you have to have already. The number one thing is you need to have the concert date, day, time, and location. You want you need that crystal clear in your mind. You need to know exactly when that is going to happen because everything else that you do in the rehearsal and the building up to it, well, it doesn't happen if you don't have a solid concert date. The next thing is you need to understand or make a decision about what your rehearsal commitment is going to be. Remember, you're asking people to come play your music. You know, 
you of course you're gonna want like hours and hours of their time playing your amazing music and oh it's so wonderful and great and that's probably not realistic and not very respectful of their time either I, I'd recommend for even something that is less than 10 minutes and it's like a standard instrumentation I usually aim for I've got the concert date I aim for a dress rehearsal run or you know maybe a short 30 minute rehearsal like the day of the concert one one hour rehearsal sometime before that ideally not too far away you want them relatively close if it's a bigger piece you might need to ask for more that's kind of up to you and the parameters of the piece that you're working in if you're putting together a large group of people let's say you're doing something crazy like doing a win ensemble piece for your master's recital I did this so it was I'm speaking from experience here when you have that many people it is a smart idea to go ahead and decide when the rehearsals are going to be go ahead and book the rooms go ahead and have that here's rehearsal one here's rehearsal two and here's the dress can you make that and they might not be able to make all of them but they're already acquiescing to the schedule that you are providing if you're doing something that small and like a chamber thing like you are putting together a, you know like a reed quintet or something it might be easier to wait until you can see what their availability is you know you can do a scheduling poll you can use a doodle poll or like a google form i mean they're all free don't pay for a scheduling app you want to be clear about how many rehearsals you need for a thing at least have one big rehearsal if you're going to go for it the third thing that you need is the incentive for the players this is kind of a controversial one but are you going to be able to pay them probably not you are a fellow student. You're pro if you're a student, you probably don't have bags of money sitting around in your house. Probably don't have that. We probably don't have a means to pay them. And performers, that's what they want to do. They want to get paid even if they're students. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to have some type of incentive for them. So what I would recommend is bring food. You might not be able to get something huge for everyone, but a, a pizza at rehearsal phew, makes a big difference you know don't underestimate the power of pizza people will happily show up if they hey i'm going to give you th two or three slices of pizza or donuts whatever whatever thing is nearby that you can work with be as inclusive as you can don't just assume everyone can eat pizza not everyone's dietary stuff can match that so you know when you're asking them if they agree to play you might say hey like i'm going to be bringing some food what's your dietary stuff just so i can be inclusive you don't want like one person left out one they can't eat pizza so their situation already sucks but then two they're left out so you don't want that but you need a clear incentive that's super important as you tap into your network sometimes you still have to what's called the cold call you still have to reach out to them over email email is the professional standard you should always do that that's at least the bare minimum and it can be really awkward to send an email to someone that you don't know and be like hey you want to come play my thing it's kind of tough so what do you do i've got a template that you can use to build your email that you're going to send to people as you're gathering people uh it's pretty straightforward i've used it successfully and i think it highlights everything that you absolutely need to send hello person i hope you are well my name is me the composer i'm a composer and fellow student at the school that you both attend uh, i am looking for an instrumentalist and you are recommended to me by my friend thank you so much your name you will also include a signature that has your name your email your phone number and your website or social media or link tree whatever thing that you have you're not going to get everyone with this when people say no you want to be gracious and thankful for it remember just because there it's a no today doesn't mean you're not going to be able to work with them in the future in fact you will find people are really pleasant to work with who actually take the time to be professional when they respond to their email you will you will think of them next time that you're you're looking for someone that plays their instrument a simple like thank you for letting me know no worries i would also if you're still looking let's say you know you're still trying to fill the viola section or whatever you might ask them hey could you recommend anyone I, i'm still trying to find people and any re recommendations would help thank you so much what you want to avoid like the play is ghosting people now sometimes you ghost someone on an accident you just forget to respond and then it's awkward and you know, you know it's been like seven days or something you forget ghosting people is unprofessional you know i'll start a conversation with them and as soon as it becomes clear that i'm not going to pay them and that it's a volunteer thing instead of just saying hey i can't do it they'll just they just i never hear from them again and that sucks because it's totally okay if people can't if they're not available so don't be that person you know you always want to respond a simple thank you so much for letting me know have a great rest of your day name 
It goes a long way in keeping you in that person's mind as someone who is positive and easy to work with. And that is invaluable. That is your career is staked on that. When you have your group and you're doing the scheduling, uh, you know, if you're using the doodle poll or whatever, uh, I also recommend adding in there, getting their contact information in terms of their email and their phone number if possible. Now, the reason I say this is because inevitably someone is going to be running late to rehearsal or they're going to forget. It will just be a thousand times easier if you can just text. You want to always use email. I only use someone's cell phone unless I like know them personally or it's an emergency. Hey, uh, we started like 10 minutes ago. Not sure where you are. Can I help you in any way? Remember to send a reminder email at the beginning of the week and the day of or a week in advance, whatever, however you want to do it. Every email that you send to people has the full schedule. And as you knock things out, if you finish rehearsal one or two, if you're having multiple, you know, you just remove them. Every email needs to have the concert date. Now you've got a rehearsal set up and it's about time to show up. You need to switch gears again into being a different person depending on the context that you are in. If you have a conductor, that makes your life a thousand times easier. You just need to be the composer. You need to be there with a score, following along in the process. You need to be quiet unless you are called upon. You know, you need to have an answer ready to go. You need to be patient because people are going to play things wrong the first time and you need to not freak out about that. It's okay. It's okay. They will get better. You have a you have a different relationship with the work. You know it. You've you've worked on it forever and, you know, these people are reading it for the first time and they are only reading what you have given them. Cut them some slack. Don't freak out. Don't be that person. You want to be completely, you know, just thrilled to be there, positive and gracious. That's what you want to be. If you notice something is going wrong and the conductor isn't addressing it or, you know, the players aren't noticing it, you want to wait for a moment to, to bring it up. You never interrupt them. Never interrupt. It's not worth it. It's just... Don't do that. That's not, it's not a good look. But you want to wait. And when you do, you want to, the way you want to structure it is you want to be a possibility person and you don't want to be a problem person. Problem people only focus on what is bad. They don't point out how to make it better. It's just, oh, this was bad. And they're usually too direct. They're, and they might even come across as being accusatory. They're not curious. They are judgmental. Possibility people, however, well, they only focus on what the music could be. Could it be better? Could this thing be a little smoother? They ask questions about how to, you know, how to better manage and, and, and better focus, you know, the, the, on the group dynamic rather than pointing at like an individual and be like, oh, this is wrong. It's less about individual critique and more about how can this be better. They are not judgmental. They are curious about what's going on. Problem person would be like, hey, this section was a mess. Like we gotta do that again. That it just wasn't very good. Trombone, I, I think you were I think you were dragging. So you were you were dragging there. So watch out for that. Instead, I might try saying Hey, could we try this section again? Uh, you know, maybe we could go a little slower just to lock the groove and make everyone feel more comfortable. They're both acknowledging the same problem. The section didn't go well. That is, f that's fair to say. But the second one doesn't point the finger at the poor trombone player and be like, oh, you're the one that was dragging, blah, blah, blah. Because now that person, you know, whether intended or not, whether it's true or not, feels defensive. It, it just creates a, a negative spiral that you don't want to have in your rehearsal. Remember, you want your rehearsal to be fun and, oh, we're doing some new music and you want everyone to feel welcome and invited. Critiquing people individually is just not, not the way to do that. It's easy to do. It's easy to slip up and, and go straight to it. You want to, as much as possible, can we do this? Can the group do this? Can we try this again? You know, that's what you want to be focusing on. Think about how you talk to your people. If you have a conductor, they're going to be handling this. But if you do need to bring up something that the conductor might not be addressing that is the way to do it if you don't have a conductor and you're not going to conduct then you're going to need to change gears and turn into the coach the coach has a little bit more of an involved role than the composer and you may not honestly know which one you're going to need to be until the group starts rehearsing all kinds of different groups whether it's like an established chamber group like a string quartet or a woodwind quintet or a brass quintet they all have an implied leader within that group. Like in a brass quintet, it's just implied that first trumpet is the leader. That doesn't always mean that they are the leader, 
but when when no one knows each other, it's kind of a, a, a just a, an unspoken rule that first trumpet is the leader. Flute would be the leader in the woodwind quintet. The first violin would be the leader in the string quartet. So on and so forth. Depending on their group, depending on the balance, depending on if they have played together or if they're strangers to each other, you may need to be more involved or not. You see, if you have a friend who plays in chamber music, go sit in on a, on a rehearsal with the, with the faculty member and see how the faculty member talks to the group, how they point out things, how they might suggest, hey, uh, can we try this again and just have the bassoon and the horn together to lock this in? You'll learn a lot from that. And that might be how you have to be. It, that's kind of, it's kind of the Wild West. It kind of depends on who they are and what the situation is like. The coach is there to, to observe balance and to offer solutions. You know, it, it is imperative that you speak to everyone with respect, uh, you know, and, and possibility. You need the score there. You got to have the score. Ideally, they just will work on it themselves. Like if it's a group that, you know, it's a brass quintet and they've already played together, they might already gel and you can just be there to, you know, be the more the composer and less the coach. It just kind of depends on the group. There's no real way of knowing until you're, you're there and you're doing it. You're going to be okay. If you are going to be the person who conducts, that is a very different role and a very different set of responsibilities than just being the composer. If you are a composer, I strongly encourage you to take an instrumental conducting class or a choral conducting class, ideally both, before you try to do this. A lot of people think that conducting is just waving your arms around and it is far more complicated than that. If you are inexperienced, you may be hurting more than helping the situation. But if you've decided to go this route, if you're like, I'm, I'm gonna conduct this piece, this is what I wanna do, and this is what's gonna go on, and you've never done it before, here are my recommendations for you. Number one, you need to practice with a metronome. You may think that you know the piece because you wrote it and you're a composer, but knowing the piece is different than being the piece for other people. Conductors don't know pieces. They embody pieces. They don't, they don't have it just all in their brain. They literally have to be Beethoven V, or be the Firebird, or be whatever piece it is that they are conducting. It's through their physical manifestations that the music comes alive. Now, yes, they have to, they have to study it. They have to get it in their mind, but that's not the only thing that they do. And part of it is actually physically practicing doing it. If you haven't spent any time practicing the beat patterns, it's kind of problematic. Uh, so you, you want to do that. You want to turn the metronome on and actually go through and get comfortable beating time. It's worth practicing. It's like, it's like an instrument. You have to practice it. As you're going through and you're studying your score, write down descriptions in the score of how you want the music to sound and to feel. Like, oh, I want this horn solo to feel very warm or mellow or, you know, I want this chord over here to sound harsh and dense. And it can be hard to come up with that language on the spot as you are conducting the first time. So it's always good to just have little words and descriptors of how you need it to be. So I, I strongly recommend that as you're, as you're going along. At the very least, if you're, if you're doing the bare minimum, you should try and be a time cop. Time cop is not the same thing as conducting. Conducting is a whole art form. Uh, being a time cop, however, like a, you're like autopilot. You're like a like the human metronome. We are in four here, everything's going on. Now we're gonna switch to three and you're giving people time and reference. That's totally fine. It's not the most musically exciting thing to bounce off of as a player, but it's it's better than nothing sometimes if, if parts are, are kind of difficult. You will feel the turbulence of the tempo. As soon as you start conducting and they start doing things, you may fall for the trap of dragging because you hear them just slightly behind you. And this creates a feedback loop where like you start going and they're going slower so then all of a sudden you're you know, going really slow. You don't need to do that. You need to keep it firmly in your mind that they adjust to you as the conductor. They follow you and you don't want to follow them because then that's not conducting. That's just dancing or choreography or something. If you have time, you should practice giving a cue. So what that means is whatever beat is going to come in on, you need to give a prep. Now the cue itself can be very simple. So I'm going to give a cue on beat one of a measure. So I've got one, two, three, and four and you point out and you give them a beat before as a little prep you might even if it's a wind player you might practice breathing them in one two three boom you put that on whatever beat the beat before gets the prep so if i move it back and i'm doing it you know on beat let's say on beat three so one three and so on 
It's just worth practicing. That's a really simple way to do it. If you have a conductor friend, get them to teach you. As you're doing this, you may be you may find yourself afflicted with conductor's blindness and or deafness. This is a real thing. It's called sensory overload because you have taken this time to learn this piece and now you are in front of people and you are probably nervous as you're doing it and realizing, oh man, I am really not ready for this. And as soon as you start conducting, you might honestly have so many things going on in your mind that you're not even able to hear the music. It might be wise to have a friend who is nearby who can listen in and help you with balance as you're going along. Just be aware of that. Like that's the thing that happens. It's totally normal. The last thing I would say, if you're going to take the time and you actually have the ensemble and you've taken the time to study and you're going to do it, you should record yourself conducting. Take your cell phone and put it on a stand or get a little tripod or something, however you want to do it, and record yourself. Put it to where the camera can clearly see you, can see some of the members, but can clearly see you, and you will learn so, so much. <laughs> Oh, man, we think it's hard when we hear our music or when, you know, uh, other musicians listen to themselves, you know, recordings of themselves. Try watching yourself conduct people without cringing. Yeah, good luck. See you later. Okay, just be yourself. You're, you're going to be, if you speak with possibility and you're not trying to be judgmental and you're trying, you're curious about, you know, what, what's working and what's not working and you listen to the players and you talk with them, they're going to have solutions that you don't. If you're following those basic things, you're probably going to be fine. It's going to be a okay. Before the rehearsal, you are going to arrive early and you are going to set up the room. You're going to get all the stands. You're going to get all of that done well in advance so that you don't have to waste any of your rehearsal time putting together the room. You're going to bring a score. You're gonna bring an extra score and you're gonna bring copies of all the parts. You're gonna put them on the stand. You're gonna, you want all of that set up as you walk in. You're also gonna bring the incentive. This thing of donuts, pizza, whatever. Go ahead and set up your phone, press record and just have it there. I recommend putting it on airplane mode if you're gonna use your phone, unless you have uh, you know, a regular recording device. Try and get the whole rehearsal. Don't do takes, don't do cuts. You can, e it's so much easier to edit that out later. If you are conducting, you need to have it at you know your phone or whatever device as a conductor cam. And, or if you're having a friend conducting it, you should be their conductor cam. They will be eternally grateful because footage for conductors is the most valuable thing in the world. At the beginning of the rehearsal, you want to give clear goals as to what's going on. You want to be like, hey, uh, welcome guys. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. If I haven't met you in person, I'm so-and-so. I wrote this piece. Uh, we are going to read the piece down and then we're going to rehearse backwards. And our goal is to master this section. If it's if you have multiple rehearsals or you know whatever. You, whatever the plan is that you've talked about with the conductor, that's what you want. Do not waste time with like icebreakers, you know, learning everyone's names and stuff during the rehearsal. You can do that before. You can do that after, not during. Uh, and the reason for that is it's not about you. You need to treat this like it's a business. That you know people res will respect you more from that, and you want to be respectful of performers' time. The worst I've ever seen of this was a conductor spent 15 minutes, 15 minutes of a rehearsal, learning everyone's name and asking them if they like Game of Thrones at an 8 a.m. rehearsal on a Saturday. That was volunteer. Don't do that. <laughs> don't don't do that. Be respectful of people's time and they will thank you for it. When you're finished re with the rehearsal, thank everyone, be appreciative, be positive, be fantastic. Make sure that they get the incentive. Hey, you know, if you, there's still some pizza left, don't forget to set the room back the way it was. It really sucks for the teacher who has to come in the next day and there's chairs everywhere. You're gonna send them a thank you email the next day. Hey, thank you guys for a fantastic rehearsal. It was great getting to work with you guys. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys at the next one, which is on blah, 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 blah. Every email that you send has the schedule included in it. And as you know, more rehearsals happen, you just take them away. Before too much time goes away, think about what sections need improvement. What, you know, what can you do to, to make it better? Like, man, you know, we really weren't lining up at this part here. While the rehearsal's still fresh in your mind, go ahead and make those notes. 15 minutes. That's, that's essentially it. If you've done, if you've gone through those things, you should have had a, a decently good rehearsal. And that's a very exciting thing. So thank you so much for watching. I'm curious, what have you done to make your rehearsals be successful? I'm really curious about it. And I'd also love to hear if you have any horror stories of, of, of rehearsals, like which ones are like, oh, this was this this was bad. Please share it because we can all learn from it. I you know, there's there's so many things that can be learned from what has gone well and what didn't go well and why. Uh, so leave it in the comment. I, I read every single one. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Cheers.